Yeah. Yes, okay. Yes. All human beings own various identities. Um, I, I, I own several identities. Um, one of which I most proudly say is the identity of a grandfather. Um, and that identity poses a major problem to me. It is, I think, the right of every grandparent to imagine that the future for their grandchildren will probably be more beneficial, more productive, more peaceful, more harmonious than the life they themselves have lived. But now, according to science, that for me is an unlikely um, outcome for my grandchildren. And that poses me with a very major problem. So how on earth am I going to make a contribution as a grandparent to my grandchildren um, which will meet the expectation that I have? Where will I search for wisdom? My task today is to take you to a particular book of the Bible. I could take you to the wisdom literature, which would be obvious, and to Psalms or Proverbs or the book of Job. But I am to take you this morning to the book we know of as Genesis. Everybody knows, or at least they think they do, something of the creation narrative in Genesis. It's possibly one of the best known pieces of scripture uh, in the faith community. What it is reasonably well known it is actually greatly misunderstood. So let me give a tiny bit of background. Uh, Genesis is part of what is known as the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Also what is known as the Torah, or the Law. And when you spell Law, mostly we spell it L-A-W, but in relation to Genesis, it could be better spelled L-O-R-E. It is the basis of our understanding of the origins of the species, not simply of the past, but of the, of the destiny to which we travel. So the first 11 books of the Bible, the first 11 books of Genesis, aren't really just an historical account of the past. They are an interpretation of the way in which uh, life has emerged, uh, the reason for life, and the destiny to which it travels. So the first 11 books of the Bible are about the first age, they're about this age, and about any age to come. And I, as an individual human, are identified in this particular, in this narrative, as you all are. Now, when you enter the, when you have a look, first of all, at the text of Genesis, even a cursory view will find that you're reading mutually contradictory pieces of scripture. They can't obviously be taken literally because one account is different to the next account. So the first account of of creation in Genesis has us um, talks about humanity as a whole, Adam, the human race, from the Adama, the earth. Whereas the second account seems to be more specific. It has to do with the individual uh, and the journey of the individual. And that comes really to my first point about the Genesis narrative and the whole biblical narrative. It is actually dealing with the the, the problem of how the individual and the universal relate to one another. And this, to me, is a, a, an extremely important issue and it relates very much to the current environmental movement. That it isn't simply possible for a single part of the created order to see itself as separate to the rest of the created order. And in this respect, it is my contention that possibly for the very first time, that we can claim that Christianity, or the biblical narrative and science, sing from the same song sheet. Both make the emphasis that today we have to see everything in the light of everything else. Everything is related to everything else. And uh, the importance of this cannot really be overstated. And one of the difficulties that we have within the um, uh, Western form of Christianity is that we have developed a form of individualism which is actually quite quirk, quirky as far as the Bible is concerned. And um, it, it, it is extreme form which we see in much of the church in the United States of America and even in Australia and of course in Australian politics. It actually is one of the great dangers in terms of the future for my grandchildren. If my grandchildren are to see themselves in isolation from the created order, or in isolation from the rest of humanity, 
then they, they do uh, face a very difficult future. Um, two weeks ago, or a little bit more now, I was involved with a, uh, um, a heads up in a restaurant with uh, Will Stephan, who is the leading uh, climate scientist here at the ANU. This topic was called, the topic was the scientist and the bishop. And we were discussing this very matter of the relationship between the individual and the whole created order, and how we have to see ourselves as part of, not apart from. So the book of Genesis really puts forward a proposition which is at the heart of faith, that is, that we live in a relational world. Um, and we can understand the world materially, we can understand it physically, the scientists, uh, Einstein and so on, help us to understand the world from a particular perspective. But it is also terribly important that we understand the world from a relational perspective. And um, this now comes to my second major point, and that is that if the world is relational, if it is relational, then limits are as important as aspirations. And I would contend that in the 21st century, humanity has to understand where the benefits of limits lie as much as where the benefits of aspirations lie. Uh, we live in a culture in which limits are really not entertained as a possibility, or they're diminished, or they are uh, decried. But to live harmoniously in the world painted by the Bible or by Scripture, we actually live in a world in which limits are absolutely essential. And my PhD thesis is about Sabbath, and the Sabbath ethic, as it is developed in the Bible, is actually a development of the idea of the way in which we live within the boundary of limits. There is a certain amount we can take from the land and a certain amount we should not. Certain things have to be returned, stand in the right place. Um, and uh, every seven years, certain cycles have to be repeated, and every 50 years, etc. There are limits to the way in which we engage. I've been married to the same person, or the same person's been married to me for 51 years. And I think it has been a great partnership. But both of us have had to understand the limits, as well as the aspirations, that make that relationship work. And I have nine grandchildren, and it's um, um, part of my task, I think, is to help them to aspire as much as they possibly can, given the talents that they have. But it's also my task to teach them how to live within the limits of the world of which we are a part. And as I say, I think the 21st century will be, um, uh, the, the great challenge of the 21st century will be to embrace this, this particular aspect of humanity. I was in a a gig two years ago at the National Library in honour of Philip Adams. And um, the topic was, does humanity have a future? Uh, most of the speakers were philosophers and scientists, and uh, none of them saw any, much hope for the future. Um, I was the only one who offered a glimmer of hope from a religious perspective. But it is possible, given uh, uh, Jason's early speech about uh, the length of duration of humanity on the face of the earth, that unless humanity actually understands the limits, that we may, in fact, have a shorter duration than we ought to have. I might come, I've got two more points, and I've already now I'm over halfway through. When the creation story begins, it, it actually, it introduces, if you like, a struggle about how does God relate to, to creation. Because if, if everything is God, and then suddenly, suddenly there has to be creation, then there needs to be space. God has to allow the space for this. There was a, a um, Jewish rabbi in the 16th century called Isaac Luria, who struggled with this issue in what is called Zimzon, in which uh, he postulates that God uh, withdraws sufficiently to allow um, to allow creation uh, to take its place. And I think that in the first part of the creation narrative, the story is not so much about what is created, but about the space which is enabled for the living things to take their life. So there are three spaces, as you know, uh, the space of the sky or the heavens, 
space of the earth and the space of the water, and things are separated in order to create the space. I've been asked many times to ask what is the vocation of a Christian person, and I actually have come to the conclusion that um, primary vocation is to be guardians or keepers of the space. The difficulty is that we fill the space. Um, uh, we, you probably all know that this age has been postulated as the age of the Anthropocene, the, the age in which humanity totally fills the whole space. And we have to learn, as it were, to be the guardians of the space in which other things can prosper and, and multiply. Um, and uh, in my vocation as a priest and a bishop, I've seen that very much as my role pastorally with people, actually. Uh, when people are under stress, it is because the space for them to live sufficiently well has been, has been denied and the space needs to be created again. I think time's running out. I want to come to uh, really my, my main, main last point. The, the, the creation narrative uh, doesn't really stop with the story of the Garden of Eden. It continues on right through the Noah narrative. And the Noah narrative has to do with the consequences of humanity's inability to understand its place within creation. And uh, humanity that exceeds its place actually reverses the order of creation. In the flood, it is actually the waters that have been put down below that actually flood the earth, not the rain that comes from above. It's actually the, the uh, subterranean water that floods the earth. Human disobedience reverses the order of creation. And this is so, so true of humanity at the present time. Unless we understand our place within the space of creation, uh, we are in danger of actually reversing this order. But at the end of the Noah narrative, we come to the first covenant of the Bible. And the covenant is with all living, with everything that comes out of the ark, and with the earth itself. Um, some years ago, I had a talk, uh, I heard a talk given by Lord, Lord Jonathan Sachs, the chief rabbi, or he used to be the chief rabbi of Great Britain. And he says that all the other covenants of the Bible should be understood in relation to this covenant that God makes with the earth and all living. If we believe that we have a covenant made with us that makes us special as a Protestant, as a United Church, as an Anglican, as a Sunni or a Shia or a Jew, it doesn't matter what those covenants are, from Abraham or David or Jeremiah or even Jesus himself, all of them actually focus back on the primary covenant of, of the covenant with all living. And so as a Christian, our primary vocation is to serve the common good of all living. And it is, it is through fulfilling that covenant that we are blessed, and it's through fulfilling that covenant that we find unity with the rest of the faith community and indeed the rest of the world community. So, Samuel, Zachary, Matthew, Noah, Thomas, Bella, Anna, Jessica, and Benjamin. I am your grandfather. I deeply regret that I may have lived in, a, in an era that has been more harmonious to my life than it's likely to be for yours. However, I've gained confidence from the knowledge that I can be drawn to the text of Scripture, which is my fundamental revision as it is yours, and to learn from it that there are ways of understanding the future which unfolds. One of them has to do with understanding the limits and seeing in the limits more rather than less. Freedom rather than exclusion. Freedom rather than restriction. I understand through the scripture that I am part of the creative order. The trees, the flowers, the birds, all living are my brothers and sisters, as St. Francis said. And understanding that and living it and, and embracing it in the 21st century is part of the future which can be yours. And finally, you are the servant of living. You are to be part of a community which is which goes beyond the identity that so far you have chosen for yourself. 
You are the sum total of all the paths that have intersected with your own. Mine, the ones in the future, the ones in the past. It was through understanding these things that the 21st century will unfold, and it can be, and still could be, even more harmonious and beautiful than the time that I had enjoyed. So, grandchildren, go to Genesis and the Biblical Scripture, and you'll find within it uh, indications of where the future might lie for you. Thank you.